Okay, we're back inside the Cube. This is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise and share the knowledge of our guests with you. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We're very pleased to invite back Pauline Nist, who's a Cube alum. Pauline, welcome to Thank the you. Cube from Intel, general manager of you know, server division, really appreciate you spending time uh, coming back to theCUBE here at H yeah, HP Discover. Yeah, You guys have had a busy week. I've been following you online and you're all <laughs> over the place this week. You know, it's, it's our demand. summer chore. It's not even the summer yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the demand for theCUBE is uh, great and we're going to launch a 24-7 channel in the fall. Oh, uh, cool. We're going to have morning and uh, afternoon anchors and then all So I have insomnia. I can watch yeah. theCUBE. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, there's so much distribution. Xbox. Yeah, um, yeah. Justin TV, all the outlets. There's so much demand for the content because uh, you can't get this on cable. Well, you, you know what you're going to need now. You're going to need a big data installation to get all of that social media data about who's watching you and where they're watching you and what, what the hot spot topics are, you know? Careful, you'll be, John's going to show you our demo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the demo's expanding every day. Yeah, no, we do, as you know, we showed you, we use big data to do predictive analytics for our media business. Um, mm -hmm. And yep. we just spun that off as a separate company. Oh cool, um, I hadn't heard that. Silicon Valley, we have a data scientist and developers on board. Hadoop, it's really a cu cutting edge age base. And I do owe you coming to see that. Yeah. I, uh, we're, I'm we're going to show it to you. you. We, we want you to look at it because you're so smart, we want to get your perspective. Because it's we're, we're learning. We're and all we're not, learning. We're, we're trying to figure it out and um, we're learning some great insights, but more importantly, we're not going to try to force it. We're going to let it kind of flow and see how this thing develops. But but it's exciting. We're seeing things, uh, uh, and we're seeing we're meeting people we've never met before with these tools because now we have access to long tail of people, right. and it's just so exciting. I'm well, excited. I actually think tools like yours are almost part of what's going to displace the search engine mentality. I mean, I know that laying in front of the Google train is a very dangerous thing to do, and I could be in like six pieces, but they're not. They're not breaking, you know. They're not hot spot of the minute. Right. And you know, I was telling somebody the story this morning of when the plane went down in the Hudson. My niece had a good friend who was in a building facing the Hudson River and saw that plane. I mean, I had pictures of that plane in the river before anybody mm. was reporting it anywhere. And that's that's the way media travels today. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that's it's, it's the exciting. way information comes about. What do you? Um, uh, okay, since you're here, I'll just share the demo. <laughs> So, so we can search, this is our 2.5 million users, so we have a, now a search function, so I can get all the Hadoop affinity of all the, whoops, did I log off? Yeah, I logged off. So we now in real time can see what people are doing in our communities, globally by the way, this is not just our site, because we have site yep. analytics, but this is like affinity ranking. So right. we have, this is all the Hadoop affinity, people that are, have affinity towards big data, mm -hmm. and specifically Hadoop, Classified, so I just use random. Just pick one here, just out of the blue. Um, the founder, stealth startup. Oh, they're not stealth anymore. He's the CEO, sold it to VMware. Um, big data, cloud, serial this. entrepreneurs. See this. So, so mm. I would never. These people are all out there in the. And that was real time, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So we could monitor them. We see the conversations, and what that does is allows us to get new insights. What are they talking about? Who's they're sharing with? So Hadoop has enabled us to do that. So my question to you, as you mentioned before we started, what do you see with Hadoop and around some of the big data uh, applications? Because Hadoop's been great for us. It's batch kind of going to near real time. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really near real time yet, but it's you know, seconds is, I guess, near real time. Right. Real time is defined milliseconds. But right. What do you see there? Because it's going to be cores are required, flash is required. Oh, we love it. We love it. More cores, more screens. You know, more uh, so sockets. It's a, you know, it's a great product for for Intel. Um, I just think that it's taken information, as you say, to a whole other tier in this near real time. Because I certainly understand that there are people who want absolute real time. If you're instrumenting an oil well or you know a production line or something, you you know if you want to monitor and adjust equipment, you actually need real time. But I think for a lot of the media, retail, you know even healthcare kind of stuff, near real time is going to be fine, and it's going to give people an order of magnitude over what they have today with Batch. I mean, I was talking to Macy's people. Macy's goal is to unify their web and their store inventories and to be able to reprice all inventory in under an hour, which today takes them days, if not weeks. And, and that's an incredibly powerful thing, particularly when you're selling on the web. Um, they're also going to unify the inventory so that if, uh, today, if they're out of something on the web, um, 
you're out of it and your only choice is to go to a store and see it. You can't see the store inventory. They're going to change that and they're going to equip their biggest stores to be able to direct ship from you and literally buy like it was web inventory but it's in the store and you can get it and that gives them much better pricing control because today if something sells out on the web but doesn't move in the store, they market that on the, on the store. They don't ship it over to the website and sell it for full right. price. But I'm, I'm where you are which is the other thing that's really exciting is just following what's happening, what's changing, what's emerging, what people are doing. If you're in the media business, that's what it's all about. And I'm going to have to get you to sign me up as like a beta site or something so okay. I can look at this cool stuff. Awesome. We'll do it. <laughs> yeah. We'll do it as well. I mean, first of all, we love having you on, having you look at it. We want you to, to look at it because we need your help. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the near real time because I think real time scares people mm -hmm. because not everyone's doing an oil rig yeah. or doing hedging and financial and or other high capacity, I mean high performance. So near real time is good, and, and but let's change it to more of an architectural question. Let's take companies like SAP, application workloads, and it, it's weeks to minutes. Mm -hmm. So what is it in the infrastructure in terms of the components now? How is that changing? We're seeing, for example, I was just talking to a, a flash uh, provider um, uh, off the record, and they're saying they take an SAP workload, a normal application on the web, five minutes to load, to five seconds with HANA and Flash. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of architectural changes that are changing the experiences of consumers and, and customers. What's your perspective around the system architecture here? What's your view? Um, I think two things are happening. I think that um, people are learning a lot more because of the, uh, the capabilities that are available today about how to manipulate the data. I mean, everybody's doing, it used to be kind of lunatic fringe, but everybody's doing compression and decompression now. I mean, the way you make this stuff real time is you want to keep it in memory. The way you keep it in memory is you got to have a smaller footprint because today, you know, if you want uh, terabytes of memory, it's still pretty, you know, you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. So you've got compression, you've got, and that's being enabled by computes. I mean, it's nothing more than compute cycles to compress it and decompress it. Um, the same thing with, uh, with the flash stuff, and I think we're on the cusp of seeing um, in the next, you know, three years, four years, another major revolution in memory technology with, we talked about this last time, I think next generation and VRAM is going to be denser, it's going to be different technology, you've got all the big guys um, playing around with it in the lab today, certainly not ready for being a product, I mean, HP published a, a major paper on their Memristor technology last November at a European conference, which I blogged about if you want to go read it, um, and um, I think that, uh, that what it means is that you're going to continue to see um, as these new technologies start to show up, the revolution continue. I mean, we're investing in our many integrated core chip, which is a compute chip for high performance computing, but I think you're going to see um, data people look at it for driving decompression, which is a real time thing. You've got lots of time to compress. When somebody wants that data back, you've got to re decompress it really quickly. And that's where computes come in, that's where multi-core comes in, that's where as many cycles as you can give it. Yeah, you hate that. <laughs> so, so you mentioned memory store. Uh, so thinking about Flash, as enterprise people, we probably never would have selected that technology because all the gymnastics that you have to go through to make it not wear out and make it reliable. Right. And so, do you feel like these other alternative technologies have potential given the volume that you get out of Flash with the consumer markets? Well, I think for the next generation, everybody who's anybody has got you know an oar in the water on that one, whether it's Samsung, you know, Micron, Hynix, HP. Um, so I think we're going to see some competition and we're going to see the best technology emerge. And more importantly, since all of the big guys are involved, you know, it will get to volume at some point because it'll get, it, part of the volume curve will get driven by the consumer device use of it, which is obviously a much smaller configuration but you don't have to use as many chips as servers when you can drive the volume you know, that a tablet or a laptop or a phone can drive, um, and it'll, it'll then come up into the server world, and, and I think maybe be close to you know, an order of magnitude decrease in the price. And the other one that's interesting that nobody ever thinks about, we all talk about real time and we all talk about these in-memory configurations, but um, NVRAM flash is persistent. And as people start thinking about what persistence means in the server world, it translates into reliability and availability. Um, because now it's in memory. When you go down and crash, you know, you can reboot from an image much, much more quickly because you've literally got that in memory. You don't have to load it from a, a storage device. Plus there's the possibility that we get rid of what you call the horrible storage stack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, you guys remembered. So, of course, oh, that was beautiful. So I want to ask you about uh, virtualization. Next, we can talk about the storage stack. So, Several years ago, a lot of the Wall Street analysts and many observers 
saw the virtualization trend and you know, you're running the, the Intel data center group and they said, wow, Intel's in big trouble here because all that, they, they survive <laughs> because it's all this underutilized capacity. Wow, they're going to be in big trouble um, when, when the world virtualizes. Exa exactly the opposite has happened. What did people miss? What's actually happening and what's the future hold? Well, I think they missed a couple of things. I'll try to remember to take them in order. The first one is um, high performance computing, which is growing really fast and becoming an increasingly bigger share of the market. And high performance computing, you know, virtualization is like an anathema to those guys because they don't want to give up one cycle. They want all the performance. So you, f you first have one big chunk of a fast growing market that's not virtualizing at all. So, you know, what's 30% of the market these days? And so you've taken that off the table. The second one is that I think you've seen um, what I would call the straightforward virtualization happen. You know, the well-managed, well-defined workloads um, like SAP, um, like infrastructure as a service, you know, where you're, uh, you're provisioning, you know, an office or an exchange server or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I think what, what you haven't seen a lot of virtualization in is serious production database because that kind of like HPC, you know, wants security and wants, uh, it, it hasn't bought in a multi-tenancy yet, you know, can't really get enough really big virtualized um, memory areas because you, if, you're, if you're putting a lot of the database in memory, you're lucky you can do it in the main memory you got, let alone have multiple uh, VMs on there. So that's kind of another chunk of the market that hasn't really seen as much value from virtualization as people thought. Um, so the more I.O. bound you are, um, the less you've tended to want to do it if you've got service level agreements. And you know, as I said to somebody, if you're standing in front of an ATM, you don't want to be running on a VM. I don't know about you, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what about network, the networking virtualization angle? Because OpenFlow's been out there, a lot of the big data uh, folks are saying, it's not us, we got cores, we got cores on every piece of flash, we got this thing re-architecting, it's beautiful, we're going from five minutes to five seconds. Uh, of app, but the network. Well, I am. Uh, um, there no, there's no issue with us. We had Broadcom said, no, there's no network problem. Right. I mean, come on, that's the elephant in the room. I lay, that's the one piece of technology I lay awake nights worrying about because um, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember that it was really DARPA and a bunch of government people we don't want to talk about that gave us the internet that we have today and paid for the whole backbone and the, the whole infrastructure. And it's not just, you know, getting fiber out to my house, it's who's taking that backbone to the next tier. Um, and I don't know about you, but I live next door to Los Gatos, and when people are watching Netflix movies, you know you know the web is being consumed. <laughs> Everything I slows I, I down. I talked to a, a, re, um, a partner of IBM just uh, yesterday morning um, who does private cloud deployments, and he's down in the Atlanta area. The sonnet rings are maxed out. I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. like, this is not like there's all this dark fiber laying around. I mean, this is like this capacity problems. Yep. And they got now yeah. you know, LTE, 4G, and 5G coming around the corner. It's going to suck more bandwidth, backhaul, and so. And we don't have a pricing infrastructure set up that's letting these companies invest in that. I mean, I, that's the fundamental limitation, I think, which is that until people can see how they're going to recover the cost, you know, a Verizon or an AT&T or anybody isn't going to jump in and take that infrastructure to the next level. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, and then you got Comcast who invested in that infrastructure. This is a, again, you can go on either side of the net neutrality argument, but Comcast just watches Microsoft, X, Xbox put, you know, announce MLB, NBA, ESPN, mm -hmm. live TV on the Xbox. Right. Very disruptive. 34 million well, plus people we on all the Xbox. Know, I, I don't know about you, but we yeah. all know what happens to the internet during March Madness when they've actually yeah. literally had to cap <laughs> how many people can watch a game and you can't get on until somebody yeah. gets off, you yeah. know? Yeah, and I was saying to someone, I'm like, oh, isn't that great, you can cut the cord. I'm like, but yeah, but the cord, the cord feeds the Xbox. Yes, So yes. I go, Comcast, they're doing, they're using deep packet inspection, they're going to throttle that thing down to the, crawl it's, to the ground. That's, that gets me back to the numbers game, you know, which is unless they can charge more for it, they're going to throttle. Because the only way you yeah. can afford not to throttle is you got to raise your prices to, to get the so return on a, your investment back. It's a real difficult thing, because now the lobbyists, this, we've lost this battle in the last mile with the, remember the CLEC days, mm -hmm. the, you know. So they got choked, all the innovation got choked. So I'm worried about the network I'm too. I'm worried about the network too. I'll tell you another funny network story. I was talking to a, uh, a guy from a major research hospital, so you know the tier I'm talking about. They ship data off to a national cancer database in the cloud uh, with genotyping and tumor typing information. Do you know how they ship it? They looked at all the options using the network. They put it on hard truck. drives and give it to uh, FedEx twice I a week. Say, if it's shipping on a truck, yeah. it's fast. Yeah, the exactly. The greatest so, I mean, bandwidth in the world is the Chevy truck. So setting aside right. the horrible storage yeah. stack, yeah. whoever thought hard drives were going to emerge as the interchange yeah. medium of choice. We still do sneaker We still do sneaker net in our house. Yeah. Our kids yeah. go to my laptop and put their they email the file to the 
to themselves and they go to my Gmail and right. my thing and get it in Gmail <laughs> printed out there. Right. It's like right. ridiculous. I wanted to right. ask you, Pauline, so I was at a meeting uh, at IBM, you know, Steve Mills, mm -hmm. and so it was shortly after uh, the Oracle did the acquisition of Sun and he just basically, basically said flat out, Spark is dead. And of course we know the X in EXA, the Oracle stands for Xeon. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we've, we've joked about that several times in theCUBE. So it looks like game's over, you know, X86, and then all of a sudden, you see HP do Moonshot, you saw Dell just announced you know, low power, you guys have, have Atom, uh, there's this new disruption coming. Um, talk about that a little bit. Well, first I would say there's always a new disruption coming. This is just the current disruption. You're so relaxed about that. That's, yeah. No, I mean, I think we watch it, you know, and we are making some investments uh, from everything from our, uh, our entry level Xeon parts to you know, what we're doing with Atom long term. Because yeah. um, we think it is a quotient of, of the power envelope and the density envelope and how many computes you need. Mm. And it's, um, it's certainly true that you know, there is a theory out there among some people that when you're looking at kind of generic web hosting and you want kind of the minimalist configuration that this is going to be uh, the way to go. Now, we haven't exactly seen these things flying off the shelves. In fact, we've been trying to get a hold of a couple systems to benchmark and we haven't found anybody who'll sell us one yet. So I am a little dubious about this revolution that's mm -hmm. happening if we can't put some cold cash on the table and actually buy yeah. a box from anybody. But um, I, I, I don't think we're going to be surprised about it. We're going to learn about it. We're going to benchmark it. We're going to look at how it looks as a web server, how it looks you know, for Hadoop, how it looks for other things, because we think that there are places where people want um, a richer experience and are going to want to do more. I don't think, I think the IPDC guys have got these homogeneous you know, hosting workloads, but how much of the real world that's out here has actually got a load, uh, you know, a workload that's that homogeneous and that tightly characterized? Yeah, so it's maybe five to 10 years from this point at which we start to see that, right? The internet guys right. generally lead that, right? Right, right. And so right. is that a reasonable time frame to think about this, really having an impact? Or? I, think, I think it's certainly in the five year space, also because it takes a while to develop the infrastructure. I mean, you know, it's one thing to put up an exchange server. It's another thing to run everything that you're used to running. Um, and I think that's going to be a little bit, I mean, some of us who have had alternate architectures know what creating an ecosystem is like. I have hey, we're getting, we're getting the break time, but we're just going to ignore them. No, I have one <laughs> final question, one final. I have, I have a uh, final no, question. Let's just keep going. So cloud storage, so I did a little unscientific poll amongst uh, salespeople for um, a tier one manufacturer, I won't say their name, three letter acronym. Um, and I said, how many people have customers that are actually using cloud storage? You know, mainstream customers, general purpose kind of customers, not the you know, unique uh, you know, houses in, in Hollywood, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, no one raised their hand. So where are we with cloud storage? Because that's an obvious advantage. You're seeing the, you know, the, the drop boxes and the box that put people in their cred down, putting files up there. But no hands went up? Uh, no hands went up. From a, from a cloud enterprise standpoint, no hands went up. No surprise to me at all, because my old boss, uh, who's now doing PCs, Kirk Scalgan, has been asking that question for the last six months, and he personalizes it. He says, am I going to put the only pictures of my kids in the cloud, or am I going to use the cloud for backup and have you know, two other copies of my kid pictures here in the house, you know, you know, one on a USB drive that I can put in the safe, you know, and another one on the PC. And I think that's the crux of the issue. I think that for backup, it's probably going to emerge as, you know, like my brother-in-law's a lawyer, he's a small business. He's always going to have what he needs in the four walls of his office, you know, uh, battery backed up and everything else. Um, because they're, you know, particularly for him in the legal business, there are confidentiality issues, there are security issues, you know, you might use it as a backup source. But I, you know, one of the interesting things is you got Microsoft coming out with this dual node server, you know, that's redundant, that's backed up, that's mirrored. You know, that's the Microsoft, aside from Azure, that's the other answer to it, which is you sell an SMB box that gives people more local control of their data. And that's the tug of war, I think. That's the tension of, if you're a business and your ability to boot up tomorrow morning and serve as a customer who's standing in front of you is your responsibility. Where are you going to put the data? And I think that is the use case, is backup and archive. Mm -hmm. It's great. You know? mm -hmm. We have a yeah. lot of yeah. data that we want to just get off site. Mm -hmm. Great, perfect for the cloud. Right, right. Oh, good. All right, Pauline, well listen, thank you very much for coming inside always the Cube. A, always a pleasure. Great, great to see you again. Great conversation. We'll certainly hook you with a, uh, a beta account of yeah. the, uh, the VDP Finder uh, product, it's a stealth name. Um, and great to That's have you on. Cool. And uh, we'll see you next time. We'll be right back with our next guest after this uh, short break. <laughs>